Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Raghuram Raju from University of Hyderabad. Today we are discussing the module titled Discourse Ethics and this module is written by Andrew Edgar. Discourse Ethics or Communicative Ethics was developed by two German philosophers, Karl Otto Appel and Habermas. And this gained prominence from 1970s onwards. Discourse ethics may be understood as an analysis of argumentative processes and rules that must be observed in order to secure the fairness and validity of an agreement on moral issues. So let us look at the unique feature of discourse ethics by contrasting with it with the earlier preoccupations with ethics. In earlier times, the emphasis in ethics is to state or lay bare moral rules, to deliberate about what is a good moral rule and why is it a good moral rule? Why should we accept a moral rule in our day-to-day -day life. But then that is only in, in the nature of laying bare what are the moral rules and what are the moral principles. What distinguishes discourse ethics from these earlier forms is that in discourse ethics, the emphasis is not to arrive at the a moral rule and deliberate on a moral rule but to arrive at a moral rule that's the most important thing in other words the process of argumentation is the core that distinguishes discourse ethics from other earlier deliberations on ethics that is in discourse ethics the emphasis is on people participating, arguing about a moral rule. What is just, which action is more important and which action is not more important. So discourse ethics is not concerned with making substantial moral assertions. That is as to whether abortion or euthanasia are morally wrong or morally right. Instead, it is concerned with the process through which moral agreement is achieved. So it is a process-oriented ethics rather than rule you know, justifying ethics. Further, in acknowledging that the real debate is rarely completely open and fair, discourse ethics becomes a tool through which those real debates can be scrutinized in order to expose points at which a seemingly fair and open discussion may have been marred by such factors as inconsistencies and poorly evidenced argument, or more crucially, by imbalances of power between participants, leading, for example, to the exclusion of interested parties or the suppression of their opinion. So, this is the major difference between discourse ethics and the other form of ethics. Discourse ethics, as I pointed out, lays premium or emphasis on the process of deliberating through a communicative process what is a good action and what is not a good action. In that sense, one of the major differences between ethics as normative exercise and ethics as a discourse oriented is that in a ethics as a normative exercise, there is always an attempt to arrive at close on a particular moral principle. Whereas in discourse ethics, this is not done. In fact, this is avoided. It, is, it makes ethics open-ended. Every time you deliberate, it starts all over again. Every time you end, it is not actual end, 
it continues it can be began again so that is the most important difference between discourse ethics and other forms of ethics the major difference between other forms of ethics and discourse ethics is other forms of ethics deliberate on what is a good rule and why should we accept this rule and how to accept this rule and things like that. Whereas discourse ethics is not interested in that kind of a thing in its primary as a primary task. It is more interested in looking at the process of arriving at truth. Process of arriving at truth. So one way of characterizing this difference is that normative ethics is largely interested in finalizing what is a moral rule, thereby closing on the moral rule. In contrast, discourse ethics is not interested in closing a discussion on any moral rule, but continuously put it for a discussion for a communicative processes where we deliberate time and again all the time what is a good action and why should we accept it. This is the major difference between discourse ethics and other forms of ethics. Now, <clears throat> one of the major instrumentative aspect that makes discourse ethics run or function is the what is called as universal pragmatics. The universal pragmatics is the skeleton, the core that constitutes the discourse ethics. The books that discussed this idea of a universal pragmatics by Habermas include legitimation crisis, the theory of communicative action, and then in his even his uh, early works of legitimation crisis, Habermas began to articulate what was to be the foundation of his magnum opus, a theory of communicative action, and that is universal pragmatics. Along with Habermas, there is other person, as I mentioned to you earlier, of Apple. He also developed a similar theory, albeit from a slightly different theoretical perspective along the same lines. Universal or later formal pragmatics is a reconstruction of the competence that human beings have to communicate effectively and thereby to coordinate their actions with others in society. So they all assume that all human beings have this capacity to communicate and not only to communicate but in an intersubjective way coordinate each one's views with the other. It is from this reconstruction of communicative competence that discourse ethics arises. And so an understanding of discourse ethics requires a brief review of the core ideas of universal pragmatics. That is, without this assumption, namely that all human beings are endowed with the communicative competence to deliberate, uh, to express and also to arrive at, to coordinate each other's views, discourse ethics will not function at all. So in order to understand the discourse ethics, there is a need to understand what is this thing called the universal pragmatics. Communication under universal pragmatics can, is understood as an, as an activity where two or more people come to share their worldviews. And they not only share their worldviews, they also interchange one's view with the other and express either admiration for admiration or endorsement of the other person's view or express even differences. If they express differences, then they discuss and then find out what is a viable way of overcoming these differences. Such a view is not merely a matter of about objects or people and events that make up the world. 
okay it also concerns evaluating of these constituent parts suppose i say that something is good and the other person says yes it is good so they endorse each other's view it also could be that i say that something is good and somebody will say no it is not good then there is a difference and then we will give reasons why we differ with each other and then discuss this and possibly arrive at a conclusion but that's not the most important thing it is on the basis of such an agreement that social agents can coordinate their actions for example in order to work together towards the realization of a goal that they both accept to be beneficial and desirable so they agree that that each one is endowed with the universal competence to communicate and then go on to communicate with each other genuine agreement between people will be achieved only if, if everyone involved in the communication had had the opportunity of raising doubts or objections they may have to anything else had been said otherwise it will be just you say something and i agree with it without deliberating on it that will be something which is very dogmatic they will not accept something like this they will say that whatever is said is amenable for objections and these objections must be communicated and deliberated and then possibly one can either modify one's position or take back the that position or go continue with this position the objection should have been resolved by a reasonable replay that either convinces them that their objection is unfounded or modified the nature of an agreement sought by the acceptance of the objections habermas argues that there are four different kinds of issues upon which agreements can be secured they he calls them as validity claims the four issues are related to truth of an utterance the right to make it sincerity in making it and its meaningfulness the first claim is the truth of an utterance that you can make an an utterance about a fact and then somebody can either agree with it or might disagree with it but then if it is about the factual thing then we can easily adjudicate whether my utterance or my truth claim is correct or not for instance i will say that uh, the capital of india is mumbai and then you can disagree with me and point out to the fact though it is not mumbai it is delhi okay so now we can settle this claim of mine to be either true or false and in this case it is false so how did we arrive at uh, the claim it is not by looking at the principle but by the through communication okay so i say something and you disagree with it and you tell why you have disagreed with it and i see the point that you are making and that ends the discussion the second validity claim in habermas concerns a person's right to make the utterance they make so if i ask you to get me a cup of coffee you may rightfully protest that i have no right to order you around as i mentioned to you because that's not a part of your job so you can say that it is not a valid claim the third validity claim concerns the sincerity or truthfulness of my utterance you may suspect that i am lying or simply joking or i have been just ironic here the test of the validity claim lies less in eliciting the speaker's assurance but rather in observing if their utterance is consistent with their behavior you may look to be very sincere and may be deceiving so i should be able to discriminate between what is your appearance and what is the actual reality so you might suspect me of being insincere in my promise to meet you because i failed to keep our last two appointments 
So you will say very sincerely, this time I am going to do this to you. You might still think that it is not sincere. You are maybe lying. You know why? Because when you said similar things in the earlier times, you did not make, you did not honor those promises. So there is something about that which is very important in according to Habermas. Finally, the fourth validity claim concerns the meaningfulness of what I say. You may not understand a technical or obscure term I use or a complex turn of phrases and you can ask me to rephrase or explain what I said or even to translate it into another language. Take this example that when a doctor talks to other doctor, you know, they may use certain terminology which the other doctors for the sake of exactness understands it perfectly. But suppose the same thing has to be communicated to a patient, okay? The same phrases cannot be used. If you use the same phrases, then the patient who may not have the same background as the doctors have may not understand it. So there is a need to translate, there is a need to calibrate the terminology and communicate it to people. So in other words, the, it is not only what I speak, but what is the capacity of the hearer in understanding what I speak is also very important. This is the most important aspect that concerns the intersubjective domain within Habermas. So Habermas ethical discourse or this is discourse ethics constitutes these three important aspects as part of the universal pragmatics, which as I mentioned to you earlier, is the skeleton to understand discourse ethics. We have so far discussed the universal pragmatics and various principles, aspects that govern the universal pragmatics. And universal pragmatics is the skeleton of the discourse ethics. Now let us look at what are the normative implications of universal pragmatics. Habermas and Apple hold that in order to come to an open agreement and thus genuinely to share the view of the world upon which coordinated action can be proceeded, all parties must accept that what has been said is true. There should be that consensus. Otherwise, according to them, you, you know, communication cannot take place. The second important thing that is important is that the speakers have a right to say what they have said. That you cannot say that you should not say that. Everybody has a right to say what they have said. And that they are being, since they should be sincere and they should understand the utterances of each other in the same way. So these are the three or four important aspects that are assumed in practice you know, following universal pragmatics. In practice, such open and consensual communication is something considered to be an ideal. And indeed, early in his career, Habermas wrote of the ideal speech situation. And this is also continued by Apple's notion of a unrestricted communication community. So, the package that they have in mind is that there is an ideal situation for ideal speakers to communicate with each other where they express their views and they also iron out their differences. But the problem is more strongly they argue that upon entering communication one initially presupposes that one's fellow conversationalists are speaking the truth rightfully, sincerely and meaningfully. This is what constitutes the ideal situation. In addition, you also have to assume a very important thing. That is, that you should think that everyone is abiding by the rules of communication and this is made counterfactually. That is, unless the contrary is proved, you have no right to believe that the other person is not same as you. 
To do otherwise is to render the act of communication impossible. Here, one might consider how you would communicate with someone whom you suspected of being a habitual liar. You would not be able to trust anything they said or indeed their reassurance that they were speaking the truth. No meaningful utterance could be exchanged between the pair of you. That's true. That is, if you have a liar who is speaking with you, then communication is not possible. So, the ideal situation that Habermas has set before him, or Apple has set before him, has led to some serious problems. That is, if the ideal conditions are not met, then what happens to communicative action? What happens to universal pragmatics? What happens then to discourse ethics? For Habermas, the core problem is less that real conversation and debate diverges from the ideal, but rather it can diverge from the ideal without participant being aware of these divergences. For instance, it is not that somebody is knowingly telling a lie. It also is a case that you may be doing something which is not same as the ideal situation, but unconsciously you are driven towards it. In his early works, Habermas explores what he calls as the systematically distorted communication. So let us now understand this idea of systematically distorted communication closely. For instance, you may be ideologically driven and as an ideologically driven person, you believe in certain things and you will not be convinced of the fact that what you say is colored by your ideology. Suppose if I tell you that that is not correct, you would think that I am telling a lie, whereas you will, that is the situation is that you are colored by your, 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 uh, uh, your ideology. Or the other uh, aspect of this is that according to psychoanalysis, there are a lot of our actions which are not decided by our conscious decisions but rather driven by our unconscious unconsciousness. So Habermas argued that ideologies or neurosis may distort communication. A prevalent patriarchal ideology, for example, gives us the false legitimacy for males over females, but one that is tacitly accepted by both men and women. In patriarchy, that is, okay, you have man, male dominating, over women okay but please remember that the dominance of male on the female is accepted both by male and female so in other words there is a perfect communication between male and female within patriarchy whereas you know that this is driven by ideological uh, considerations of patriarchy rather than claims about truth after laying bed the ideal communicative terrain, Habermas did see that there are certain aspects of communication which do not conform to the ideal conditions. They might be slightly a deviation from the ideal communicative action. There may be situations where, you know, there are people who deliberately deceive in communication. So in his later works, Habermas paid more attention to deliberately deceptive acts. A participant in a conversation who deliberately tries to dominate or deceive other conversationalists on the later count, not only been involved in communicative action at all, but according to Habermas, in what is called as strategic action. So this person is not interested in communicating with other, in trying to sort out the differences or to express one's preferences, rather he's trying to have a strategy to dominate the other person, to deceive another person. In strategic action, one treats the other participant as an object that one can manipulate. 
rather than discussing with them, relying on the strength of good argument, you will resort to rhetoric, lies or even threats of violence to coerce their agreement. So this is something which Habermas have factored but did not you know, accept it as a part of communicative action. So there is something that uh, 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 this is what makes uh, Habermas a distinction between communicative and strategic action can be seen to be influenced by Kantian ethics and crucially by Kant's injunction to treat every human being as an end and never merely as a means. This Kantian influence on Habermas is very, very clear. In communicative action for Habermas, following Kant, one should treat the other as an end in themselves. In contrast, in strategic action, they are merely seen as means towards achieving one's own ends. And this, according to Habermas, is not acceptable. Habermas will not accept this kind of a thing. Habermas formulates the ethical commitment to communication more formally in terms of a set of rules of discourse. And they include, one, every subject with the competence to speak and act is allowed to take part in the discourse. So everybody is allowed to take part in the discourse. There is no discrimination made at this point. Everyone is also allowed to question any assertion whatsoever. Somebody says something and you have a right to question. And that is also allowed in Habermas discourse ethics. Everyone is allowed to introduce any assertion, whatever, into the discourse. That you want to bring in some aspects into discussion, nobody should stop you from that. Everyone is allowed to express his or her attitudes, desires and needs. So there is more inclusiveness, there is no more, more open-endedness in, in terms of allowing diverse views within the discourse ethics for deliberation. No speaker may be prevented by internal or external coercion from exercising his rights as laid down in 1 and 2. So this is a larger facility for people to come and express their views and also communicate with each other. Thus, in entering into communicative action, the competent speaker is implicitly committed themselves to a set of rules that define the force of better argument. These rules govern not merely the logical structure of a debate, but also the, the moral relationship that is established between the participants. That is, they are not merely an exercise in cognitive ex exercise, but they also have a moral implication. Some speakers may quite legitimately have more power. So far, the example is, that is given is the uh, parents and children, teacher and people. Parent will have more power over children and teacher will have more power than the people. But they should not exercise this in order to oppress the people who have less power. That's not that is not acceptable to Habermas. Let us look at some principles of universalization and discourse. The emphasis that Habermas theory of communication action places on the unformed agreement of conversationalist already strongly suggest a procedural ethics. So what is important to Habermas is the procedure is important. The second validity claim to rightness highlights the moral legitimacy of the speaker as a social agent and the freedom that conversationalist must have to challenge the speaker's right to make the utterance that he or she does. Discourse ethics may be seen to go further for it theorizes not merely the conditions under which the right of the speaker is challenged, but rather the conditions under which 
any moral norm or principle is debated. That's the important thing. Every moral norm or principle is debated extensively in discourse ethics. Thus, while universal pragmatics focuses on the power relationship and moral obligation between speakers, discourse ethics looks more widely to the debate of any moral issue. So the debate or the discussion, the communication is very, very important. So Habermas formulates discourse ethics in terms of two principles, that of universalization and discourse. So discourse, all affected can accept the consequences as well as the side effects. Its general observance can be anticipated to have for the satisfaction of everyone's interest. So that is the universal principle. The discourse, only those norms that meet with the approval of all affected in their capacity as participants in a practical discourse can claim to be valid. So it is universal, but at the same time, it also has to pass through the procedurals of the discourse. Universalism holds that moral decisions are valid only if all those affected can consent to them. All must recognize the consequences of the decision and must prefer those to the consequences of any other decision. Again, this approach to ethics owes much to Kant. Kant argued that a moral principle can only be acceptable if everyone agrees to be bound by it. So there is this Kantian connection that is very important in the discourse ethics. It is universalism alone is not enough. There are many ways to bring about a universal consensus and not all need to be moral or more to the point need not all be ability to communicate. The problem with the Kantian method of resolving moral problems is that it does not actually require people to talk to each other. That's a point that is very important. That in Kant, you can have moral rules or you can have universalizability or universalness of moral rule without people participating with each other in a communication. You can arrive at Kantian moral rule without people talking to each other. The universal applicability of a moral rule could be worked out by an isolated individuals in an act of monological reasoning in Kant. But discourse ethics does not accept any such thing. In discourse ethics, what is important is people talking to each other, people conversing with each other, people communicating with each other, people expressing their views. That is of a primary concern. Discourse checks this by specifying that no normative validity is dependent upon the argument of all participants in a practical discourse. That is to say that only agreement that is based upon rational debate will count. Suppose you have just a moral rule and not debated discourse ethics will not accept that because for them deliberation, negotiation, discourse, communication is very, very important. So from this outline, Habermas draws out three characteristics of discourse ethics that serve not merely to clarify the scope of discourse ethics, but also to distinguish it from other competing ethical theories. Discourse ethics is cognitive, it is universal, and it is formal. A cognitive ethical theory entails moral judgments being justified through argumentation and the appeal is to evidence. This strongly differentiates discourse ethics from any other moral skepticism, decisionism or emotivism. That is, such approach does not allow the ethics to become 
uh, to say that it is not possible to arrive at ethical theory. It is indeed possible to arrive at ethical theory. So it will rule out skepticism about the impossibility of arriving at ethical theory. According to Habermas, according to discourse ethics, it is indeed possible to arrive at a moral consensus. The other important aspect that they will not accept is decisionism, that there is somebody can make a decision and that decision is implemented without deliberation. This is the another important thing that they is ruled out by discourse ethics. The most important aspect that is ruled out by discourse ethics is the subjectivism that is a serious issue discussed by emotivism. According to Habermas, ethical statements are not subject to statement as held by emotivists. Ethical statements are universal and they are deliberative. Ethical, ethical uh, you know, ethics arises out of communication and intersubjectivity. And this communication and intersubjectivity is not does not relapse into relativism or a pluralism. It is governed by universal pragmatics. They provide the universal or objective conditions to deliberate. So the two things, three things that are avoided by discourse ethics is skepticism, moral skepticism, decisionism, which is, can be arbitrary, or emotivism. All these three are rejected by Habermas and others and they do not find place in discourse ethics. The universalism that is a hallmark of discourse ethics entails that the validity of moral judgments cannot be reduced to cultural circumstances as moral relativist claim. Again, there is something very conscient about this discourse ethics that is Unlike Kant, it emphasizes on the universal moral principles and does not give importance to relativism or decisionism. The assertion of ethical cognitivism and universalism are bold and controversial. Seen together on a superficial level, they suggest a dangerous arrogance. This is also not the intention of Habermas that the arrogance lies in the fact that, that we all look for universalism and don't bother about the ground realities. But that should not be taken in that sense and that is not the intention of Habermas. Initially, it may simply be noted that Habermas sees discourse ethics as itself a product of certain form of social development. It is an achievement of what he calls post-conventional societies. Let us now look at this point more clearly. That according to Habermas, there was no et discourse ethics in all societies, in all times. He relates this to a specific you know, uh, time in history. He relates it to modernity. It is for him, it is a modernity that made the deliberation on rational grounds possible. These rational rationality, these deliberations are universal and rational. They did not accept anything as dogmatic. In the previous times, there may be communications, there were deliberations, there were debates, but those of them all did not give equal opportunity to, to all individuals. There was a hierarchy and that is what distinguishes this phase of discourse ethics from the earlier phases of ethics. The third characteristic of discourse ethics, which is, is formalism. It helps us to articulate the differences between Habermas position and that of moral absolutism. Borrowing a phase from Adorno, Habermas presents discourse ethics as a minimal ethics. So this is the important point that is to be noted here, that Habermas ethics is ethics that is minimal. It allows people to express their individuality more and also adjudicate their intersubjectivity more rather than 
come to prevail on the actions of individuals. That is the point that is very important. That's why the, uh, the uh, Habermas insists that his ethics is a minimal ethics in the sense that it only enables people to express their views and also communicate with each other. And if there are differences, I try to overcome those differences. And in the process, this will enable them to have a better understanding of each other. The significance of formalism can be illustrated by comparing Habermas's position to that of liberal political theorists like John Rawls. Rawls was influenced by Kant. And Rawls also offers a cognitivist and universal ethical theory in the thought experiment of the original position. So like the ideal condition of Habermas, you also have the ideal condition of the original position. Rawls talks about what is called as a wheel of ignorance as an ideal condition where everybody who is in debate with, who deliberates, who makes rational choice are ignorant about their social position, their capacity, their background, all other things, their gender, their kingship relationship, their color, and what have you. Rawls claims the rewards and treatment of every individual will be rationally justified. And the, it is in this context, there is a close relation between the ideal condition of Habermas and the veil of ignorance assumed by Rawls. However, there are differences between Rawls and Habermas. The first difference is that Rawls proceeds to derive two substantial principles of justice. Secondly, and crucially, Rawlsian procedure for deriving these principles contradicts the principle of discourse. That Rawls does not arrive at the theory of justice through deliberation, through the discourse, through communication. He arrives at it like Kant as a principle to be deliberated upon, to discuss whether what is justice and what is not justice. Let us summarize the main aspects of discourse ethics. Discourse ethics is about arriving at truths. The procedure is important and not merely establishing what is truth and what is not truth. That's the important point that we should keep in mind. That <clears throat> the, the other important aspect of discourse ethics is it assumes that every individual is autonomous and every, but every individual has a freedom to express and no individual is discriminated and every, nobody is put to any constraint in expressing. It is this open-endedness that's very important aspect of discourse ethics. The other important point that accompanies this very important theory of ethics, namely discourse ethics, is that everybody has an ability to express, to communicate, and to, to participate in this. Now, there is a possibility that since everybody is participating in the, in the, in the deliberation, that it can become either partisan or subjective. So Habermas and Apple makes, ensures that this is avoided by coming up with a very important aspect of discourse ethics, namely universal pragmatics. Universal pragmatics will ensure that all these things are become, they become universal and they become objective and they don't relapse into subjectivism. And this is a very important aspect or an achievement of the discourse ethics. This achievement of the ideal conditions that accompany the discourse ethics through pra universal pragmatics, however, have some serious limitations. It is alleged that the, the too much of this uh, ideal condition do not really make the realistic descriptions about actual conditions of how society deliberates on arriving at morality. Now, Habermas and Apple subsequently do talk about these uh, aberrations, but they would not allow to compromise on the original position of discourse ethics beyond a point.
So it is in this context that they, this is a more a deliberative, more argumentative and uh, a, 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 a procedure of dealing with ethics. And this will provide a, a very important tool in the, in the functioning of democracy. And that's the important thing. Democracy where you need to have people interacting with each other. So there is a need to accept both the normative or the ideal situation proposed by Habermas and also factor the actual conditions and, and one way of looking at how these two things come together is in the making or of democracy all over the world. Thank you.